Morning, Glory America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Quite a week for news to open 2018. In my eyes, the revolt of the people of Iran against the mullahs and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard is the story that deserves the most attention this week. At least as much attention, if not more, than the revolts of a few years back. If Iran were somehow to overthrow and get rid of its theocratic, fanatical rulers, the region and the world would be a much safer and prosperous place. But there were lots of other stories as well. And here to discuss them with me as we look back at the week that was are Xiang Min Kim from Politico, Al Weaver from The Washington Examiner, Courtney Kuby, of course, from our own NBC News, and Michael Warren from The Weekly Standard. Courtney, let me begin with you since we're talking about your first week back at the Pentagon in 2018. What do you think was the dominant story of the week? North Korea, I have to say, Hugh, Happy New Year, by the way. Thank um, you, to you. Thank you very much. We had uh, Kim Jong-un gave his annual New Year's address, and he talked about how crippling the sanctions have been in his country, but then he also made an overture to South Korea, saying that he was willing to talk to them about the Olympics specifically, about the potential for North Korea to send a delegation to Pyeongchang, the Winter Olympics, which begin in just a couple of weeks. And that led to South Korea extending an invitation to North Korea to actually speak. It's been set for January 9th. Uh, of course, there's still some staff work that has to happen before that actually occurs, but it's looking promising that there will be some discussion between North and South Korea, and they've also already opened up this line of communication that's been closed for several years now. It's just a telephone, uh, but I don't think that most people realize when North and South Korea communicate between one another, with, or back and forth with one another, they use a bullhorn. Uh, I was in <laughs> South Korea a couple of months ago, and they literally, when, they, when South Korea was informing North Korea of an upcoming exercise, they go and they use a bullhorn and shout across <laughs> to the North Koreans. So now there's but a phone Courtney, line Are we also exists. coming up on another launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile, at least one that's rumored this week? Um, I don't know um, how whether that's actually going to occur or not. I think there's some potential <coughs> for a rocket engine test coming up soon. You know, there, there's a lot of speculation about the potential for some kind of an ICBM launch or a missile launch. Is North Korea is generally, they are often ready for some kind of a launch. There's often movement that's seen around the launch sites. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to launch something, though. All right, Michael Warren, a rocket that did launch, has to do with a book that landed with a big thud all over Washington, D.C. this weekend. Is that your story of the week? Absolutely. It's Fire and Fury, uh, the Michael Wolff book that, as you said, hit Washington and particularly the White House uh, like a bomb this week. Uh, of course, the publication date was actually moved up four days uh, after some initial excerpts came out. Uh, I think this is a big story. Uh, there are questions about whether or not Michael Wolff uh, has all of his facts straight or even some of his facts straight, although they certainly reflect a lot of the uh, drama behind the scenes that he documents in the Trump White House. Uh, certainly reflects things that I and other White House reporters have been following and, and hearing from others uh, throughout the last year. Um, and uh, But of course, the, the big reason, or I would say the biggest reason this has become such a big story is that the president himself has engaged with it. Uh, very early on, the, the, the initial excerpts from Wolf's book uh, had a lot with Steve Bannon, the former White House aide, uh, now with Breitbart, back with Breitbart News, uh, essentially disparaging uh, the president's uh, family, criticizing the president's uh, family's decision, for instance, to have that meeting with, uh, with the Russians in uh, June 2016 or July 2016. Uh, and the president hit back with an official statement, basically disowning and torching Bannon. Uh, that that has and, and the fallout from that statement, the fallout from the White House's decision to say this book is tabloid trash, uh, but everything in and about it for, uh, about Steve Bannon is true and shows that he was never really a part of our organization or, or really an important player. Uh, I think has made this uh, this book and this story a lot bigger than it otherwise would have been. Al Weaver, I had Raj Shah on my radio show on Friday, Deputy Press Secretary at the White House. He said they're using the book as a book uh, stop. Is that true? Is it being read or is it being tossed out the back window at the White House? I can't speak for Russia. I'm pretty sure it's being read throughout Washington, though. And, and Steve Bannon is a big part of this week. Uh, I mean, I, I think the one way Bannon really has, uh, really has impacted things this week is, is with the midterm elections uh, coming up in 2018. Uh, you know, he's a lot of candidates coming up in 2018 who he has backed. And right now, their opponents have been given a sledgehammer to use against their primary opponents who, have, who Bannon has supported. 
Uh, so I think it's the reshaping the midterm elections in two ways. That's one way. And the other one is with Mitt Romney. Uh, Mitt Romney, obviously, is, is likely to run for the Utah Senate, uh, Senate seat that's being vacated by Orrin Hatch. Uh, Hatch, a longtime member of the Senate, was very influential. But Romney's rise really is really something of a turning point right now, especially with Bannon. He was, he was likely to be someone going right after Mitt Romney and trying to tear him down, although the unlikelihood of that happening in Utah is very remote. Uh, Romney right now, I think he's the story of the week. I think that's, uh, that's, that's something to watch for as we move toward uh, November. Now, Seung Min, I, I kept you for last because the Rubik's Cube of Congress is always hard to unwrap. But when Courtney's talking about Korea and I'm talking about Iran and Mike and Al are talking about the White House and politics, what we were supposed to be talking about is an agenda. What's happened to that agenda? It has yet to be sketched out. So the most important story for me this week clearly are the happenings on the legislative branch or lack thereof. So in terms of the agenda, the 2018 Republican agenda for this election year, it's yet to be sketched out in full. And to be fair, it's only the first week of January. Republicans will figure this out. It will start this weekend with a retreat with the top Republican leaders at Camp David with the president. Uh, there's been little hints here and there of what uh, each of the leaders, whether it's the president or Speaker Paul Ryan or Majority Leader Mitch McConnell want. Uh, infrastructure keeps getting talked about as a potential bipartisan issue this year. We also have uh, continued talk about potentially reforming welfare programs, reforming entire if uh, if Paul Ryan and uh, and uh, the administration feel they want to go ahead with that, though, they will find resistance in Mitch McConnell, who had told us repeatedly last year as the tax reform debate was wrapping up and we were looking forward uh, to the to this year's agenda, saying he doesn't think that's really on the table. It has to be a bipartisan issue and he doesn't see that happening. You know, Sung Min, I do not see entitlement reform happening either, and I'm a conservative. I'd love for it to happen, but it's not going to. What I did hope was that when the seven senators went down to the White House on Thursday, they would emerge with a unified front and a comprehensive proposal on immigration. That didn't happen. In fact, Senators Lankford and Tillis put out a rather grim statement about not being able to get to the starting blocks on the Republican side. What is the state of play on immigration reform, both DACA, the wall, and uh, chain migration and the diversity lottery? The state of play, if you're looking for a deal on, on the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, is not great, <laughs> to say the least. Um, I, was, I was actually pretty uh, taken aback by Senator Tillis's and Lankford's uh, statement once they came back uh, from the White House yesterday. It was unusually downcast for a prepared statement, and it really sh uh, began to shed a light into the state of play of these back-channel negotiations. We, had, uh, we have a Republican-only working group on, on immigration issues, who, who were the ones who went to the White House this week to meet with the president and kind of start sketching out what uh, President Trump and the administration seeks from from Congress in terms of the so-called Dreamer deal. But remember, this is something that has to get sign off from at least a significant chunk of Democrats. Um, at the very least, you need 60 votes in the Senate. The the margin of the chamber right now is 51-49. Uh, Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois has been kind of the point person negotiator for Democrats. Uh, we have reported this week, both uh, Politico and Wall Street Journal, that in terms of border security requests, um seeking about $18 billion for a so-called uh, border wall system. And Democrats uh, who, are, who, have reviewed the, who are reviewing those details say that is just a complete non-starter. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of negotiating if anything is going to get done. Stay with us. We'll be right back with the most important person of the week, not named Trump.